I want to introduce uh, Terry Delrymple, who is the head of the Global Chain Network. Uh, and uh, Terry's worked in, uh, largely in Asia and all around the world now, but uh, I think you started your career as a long-term missionary in Asia. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to let him share with you a little bit about community health evangelism and uh, uh, transformational community development and what does that look like. So Terry, welcome. All right. Thank you for joining us. I have to ask this question. Uh, forgive me, but I just can't resist. And those of you who are at home watching won't be able to see the answers maybe, but uh, how many of you are public health professionals? One, two. All right, so about half of you are doctors and half of you are nurses and three of you are public health. <laughs> and we're the stepchildren in the medical profession. Um, but we have an important role to play. In fact, uh, what I want to talk about today is community health as a framework for global mission, particularly in villages. Our network is in 142 countries. There are about 900 organizations that are involved with us. We have a goal to mobilize the church globally into a million villages. I've met with many uh, uh, public officials who said to me, the only institution in our country with the capacity to do what needs to be done in the area of community health is the church. And so we're seeking to mobilize the church. And that gives us a lot of opportunity that we don't find in other ways. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about poverty. At the uh, United Nations, they're beginning to talk about poverty not in terms of income, but using a multi-dimensional poverty index, saying that uh, there are many pressures that hold people down in poverty. Among them are our health, education, and assets. We would add a number of things to that as Christians, which also hold them down, such as worldview and relationships. But the truth is that poverty is multidimensional. And so using the multidimensional index, the uh, United Nations is now saying there, were, there are 1.6 billion poor people in the world, and 85% of them live in rural poor areas. So about 1.3 billion of the 1.6 billion multidimensionally poor in the world live in villages. Does that surprise you? It did surprise uh, me. Here's the missiological side of it, the Christian mission side of it. There are 1,200 plus uh, least reached people groups, people groups with no gospel witness among them, Missiologists are saying that 95% of them live in rural areas. And so here's what's happened. Uh, we, we heard the, the doctors talking about the 80-20 thing. Uh, and it's happening with missionaries too, where we're focusing on the urban setting and we're leaving behind those that are most marginalized, most in need of health care, and without the light of the gospel. And so our vision is to mobilize the church into those areas, into a million villages. I want to talk a little bit about uh, irresponsible recycling. I was the international uh, director at Medical Ambassadors for a while. Medical Ambassadors was an organization, is an organization that started out doing clinics, mobile clinics in rural settings. And the, the frustration that came to them as medical professionals was, we would do a clinic, people would go back and drink the same water that made them sick. The next time we came through with our mobile clinic, we were treating the same people for the same problems. And the community was not getting healthier. And so the question became, what do we do? How do we modify our strategy so that we're really improving the health of the community? 60% or more of the diseases, the disease burden in the village setting can uh, be prevented. Uh, through education and sanitation and hygiene and immunization. And so we need, we need this community health component. If we're going to have a integrated system that truly meets the needs of the people, community health has to be a part of it. So I'm looking for the day when there's one-third doctors and one-third nurses and one-third public health people. Uh, but we're, we're a long ways from that right now. I want to talk, though, about community health as a platform for total transformation. We started out uh, moving into communities 
dealing with water, sanitation, hygiene, uh, starting with basic diarrheas and problems like that and helping the people understand why they have those problems and create their own solutions. Those solutions use local resources. They owned the solutions. They shared it with their neighbors. They passed it on. And we began to see movements of change around the world. And that's where the network really came from. But community health is broader than just immunization and nutrition and sanitation and hygiene. If the problem is malnutrition, the solution is likely agriculture or food security. If the problem is a lack of knowledge, it's education. And so that moves our community health programs beyond the typical health sector into the development sector. And I believe that community health needs to be partnered with community-based development in order to truly lift communities out of cycles of poverty and disease. This is the ideal system in my mind, the pyramid of health. We have, we have the hospital at the top with, with cure. You have the clinic where you do immunizations and referrals and some treatment kind of, uh, kind of in between. And then down at the bottom, you have community uh, health or prevention. We have focused at the top of this uh, on hospitals and clinics, not only in the medical profession now, as noted earlier, there's only three public health people here, right? But, but in, in missions, we focus on the hospital and the clinic. And what's been missing in all of that is the foundation of community health, where people take responsibility for their own health and they learn how to um, uh, prevent disease and, and, and live healthier lives. They take responsibility for their, for their own health. When you get down into the community, all kinds of things come into play. The church, the family. Uh, if, if we're gonna have a healthy community, we can't have trafficking, we can't have domestic violence, we can't have, so we begin to deal with, with family and with mental health, with wellness with agriculture, with education, with enterprise. Here's another interesting fact. What is more expensive, a volunteer program in the community or the hospital? What is harder to maintain and sustain over time with funds from the outside? And for some reason, we've kind of been blind to the importance of community health in the integrated structure of our health systems. And we focused up at the top on cure, and we're not doing the work that we need to do down in the area of prevention. And we've, we've heard that hospitals that were started 50 years ago are struggling to be maintained, uh, and that we're seeing fewer and fewer missionaries going long term. Uh, all of that says to me, we need to integrate community health into our hospital and clinic systems. We need to be working together on an integrated system that delivers healthcare to communities and especially to the most marginalized. I wanna talk about some ideas in community health that need to change in order for us to really be effective. The first is that we need to focus on empowering people to manage their own health. Rather than delivering solutions to them, we need to we need to come and walk among them. And what we do in our training is instead of presenting solutions, we pose problems. We do a role play that illustrates a child dying from diarrhea. And then we have them talk about what causes that? Why is that happening? Is it happening in our area? What can we do about it? Then we lay out a framework of truth, World Health Organization standards and other things that teach about the diarrhea, and we ask them to create their own solutions. When they create their own solutions, it is locally owned, they can pass it on to their neighbor, they can pa pass it on to the next person. It's not radio broadcasts, and it's not posters, and it's not doctors coming in and, and saying, this is what you need to do. It's helping people think through the process themselves. And that's, uh, that requires a different pedagogy. 
It requires that we work with people in a different way than we've been taught to work with them as doctors and medical professionals, and even in the public health uh, classrooms. We're not, being, we're not being taught this process of adult learning. Outcomes are measured by behavior change. It's not enough for us as a church, a short-term team, a government agency to go into a village and put in a well and say we've done our job. Because the question is not, is the well there? The question is, are they using it? And there are a lot of re reasons why we go around the world and we find wells that have been put in that people aren't using. Because it's been put two miles from their home and they've been getting water across the street for generations. They don't understand germ theory. There's a whole lot of things going on in their lives that make that well useless unless they understand why they need it. Whoops, wow, that was... I was being emphatic on that point, right? <laughs> unless, unless they understand uh, why they need it and they create the solution and own it themselves, then they're going to sustain the well. And you're not going to find the situation that I find everywhere I go. I went into, uh, into Liberia with Samaritan's Purse, talked to their wash people. They said, we're putting in all these wells. Nobody's using them. I go into Laos. And there's a well with a hand, hand pump. The hand pump is broken. It took our team five minutes without tools to fix the pump. So we sat down with the people and we said, why haven't you fixed it? They said, it's not our well. So we have to understand that the community has to not only be engaged, they have to own the processes that lead to change in their own lives. And so community health needs, from my perspective, to be rethought because that's not exactly what we're, we're teaching. And here's another one. I worked on a PhD at Oxford. My daughter was injured and I had to drop out. That's a long story. But my, my thesis was gonna be on volunteerism. That, that community health programs that are effective in creating and sustaining change are driven by volunteers, not by paid people. We're not paying people to do a job. We're helping people to see how they can change their life and make life better for their neighbors. And if they own it, they're going to spend the time to make it happen. Does that make sense? And so that's a paradigm shift. There are more paradigm shifts that we're going to talk about in the area of community health. I've put the cross up here, though, because I believe if we're talking about the village, you cannot separate the gospel from their health and their development. And here's why. Everywhere you go around the world in village settings, and I've said this in 50 countries, nobody who, ha who knows the village has ever contradicted me. If you want to contradict me, come and talk to me about it. But this is the situation in the village. In the village, the major religion, whether it's Christianity in Sub-Saharan Africa, or it's Hinduism in Asia, or it's, it's Buddhism in Southeast Asia, or it's, it, it, you name it. In the village, the major religion is often a veneer over animism. And what they believe in the village is that the assets that control the destiny of their life belong to the spirits. So if you want good health, there's a certain spirit that you go to, or there are witch doctors and shamans and people like that who take care of that for you, right? And what's missing in all of that is this. They are not victims of, uh, of circumstance. They are not people uh, who have been placed uh, in a situation to be controlled by others. They are People have been made in the image of God, and the first thing God said to them was, take dominion. The resources in the community were given to them so that they could use it to make life better for themselves and for others. The gospel begins with, we are made in the image of God, and we are stewards of resources. The cross changed everything because Jesus, by his death on the cross, not only took away our sins, Colossians, but he disarmed the principalities and powers. The victory belongs to Jesus. So I want to show you some examples. Here's one shift that has to happen. 
We have to move from segregation to integration. We have to move out of sectors and learn to work across the disciplines instead of within them. Why? Because health is related to agriculture, which is related to education, which is, and you can't separate them. They all belong together. And if we're gonna lift communities out of cycles of poverty and disease, our health has to include much more than just medicine and cure. A healthy community is make, made up of people with capacity to, uh, to prevent disease and to make choices that improve the quality of their life. So people who go into these villages to do community health have to be generalists rather than specialists. They have to work across the disciplines rather than within them. And one of the ways that we've helped our trainers do that around the world, and we're working in tens of thousands of villages, the way our trainers work is when the community uh, surfaces a problem, this is what we've got to work on. We have about 10,000 lesson plans from everything to how to, how to give a physical exam to a goat, um, to, to uh, agriculture, to every disease that you can encounter in the village. There are lesson plans. They can go to those. The lessons are framed in truth, World Health Organization standards when it comes to health issues. But they start by posing a problem and lead them to a discussion in which they create their own solutions. And every one of our lessons does that for them. So we can send a trainer in that doesn't know anything about agriculture, but they have a set of lessons. They can, they can work, uh, they can identify what is the problem that we're dealing with. They can pull out that lesson and, and they have something to start with. That's not the only way to operate, but in remote places, that's almost, that, that, sometimes that's your choice. That's all you've got, right? And so we need to learn to work across the disciplines rather than within them. I want to take you to Papua New Guinea for a minute, and I want to show you why this is important. When, I, when we started working in Papua New Guinea, the district health officer in uh, Lufa district told me that they had been trying for 30 years to get people there to use latrines. I asked what percent of the population are using them. They said 3%. I said, why? He said, because traditional belief here says evil spirits inhabit human waste and they hide in dark corners. When you build a latrine, you're building a spirit house that nobody will go into. I came back a year later after we introduced the gospel and brought community health evangelism to the community. And we found um, the, the same district health officer with glee in his eyes said, we have 100% compliance. When I heard there was 100% compliance, I knew that what happened was not a physical intervention. It was a worldview change. It was the understanding that they didn't have to fear the spirits, that the principalities and powers had been disarmed. So sometimes on the door of the latrine, you would see Jesus is Lord. But nobody in all of my Bible college or seminary education ever told me that a latrine would be an indicator of spiritual growth. So you see what's happening? We're not discipling them out of their animism because we've separated the preaching of the gospel from our interventions. And at the same time, we're leaving them without answers to the very problems they need to solve in order to become healthy people. They need to understand that God has made them in his image and he has given them resources and knowledge and capacity, and they can use that to solve their own problems, and they are not, uh, they are not victims of, of the spirit world. The gospel frees us. We have 10 minutes. So here's another example. I, uh, when, when we went into, this is another district in, in Papua New Guinea. When we went in there, there were 26 tribes warring with each other. They had been fighting with each other for 16 years. No child had been educated in, in this district. When our community health team went in to do community health evangelism, uh, we immediately realized, they immediately realized, unless we stop the war, there's not going to be any progress. 
So that's what the issue becomes. And so I came back a year later, and I was standing out in an open field. The, the different tribes that had been warring, the different clans that had been warring, were all in an open field out in front of us. There, there were two chiefs. The one standing next to me, I'm the guy in the blue on the left, the, 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 the village chief there held up the bow and arrows and he said to me, I want to thank you because you've come here. Our, our, our forefathers taught us to use this bow and these arrows. And then he took one out and he said, this is the kind we use to kill pigs. He put it back in his other hand. He took another one out and he said, this is the kind we use to kill each other. Then he put it all together and he handed it to me and he said, I want to give this to you because you've come here and you've taught us a different way of life. You've taught us to live at peace with one another. So backing up to see this slide, what this slide is is a footpath between two clans that had previously been fighting. They built the footpath, they walked down to the bottom and built the retaining walls, they decorated the footpath. Nobody in my Bible college or seminary education ever told me that a footpath would be an indicator of spiritual growth. But because we've separated the physical from the spiritual, that's where we end up. So the title that I started with today is Community Health as a Framework for Global Mission. And what we're seeing is that when we minister to them word and deed, we're able to disciple them out of their animism and disciple them in ways that we can't do unless we put word and deed together. Let me stop here and talk about my own personal experience. I went to the mission field as a church planter. I was taught by my colleagues when I arrived, if you feed somebody today, they're going to be hungry again tomorrow. If you save their soul today, they're saved forever. And that's what I believed. So in my mission organization, I was the real missionary. I was a church planter. And the medical people, they were support personnel. They were only there to help me out because I needed somebody to draw a crowd and somebody to, you know, but, but I was the real missionary. I had to repent of all of that. Uh, and the way it happened was I, I was working with some men that I'd led to the Lord that were going to become the elders of the church and I asked them what the mission of the church was and they said it was loving God and loving your neighbor. I said, no, it's evangelism. They said, no, it's loving God, loving your neighbor. I went back to, my, I went back to the scriptures and, and, and I saw the prophets screaming about injustice and I saw Jesus saying, if you've done it to the least of them, You've done it to me. And putting himself in the place of the poor and the sick and the prisoner. And I realized the same Jesus who asked me to preach the forgiveness of sins commanded me to take care of the poor. And that I was choosing which of Christ's commands was most important rather than finding a way to do everything Christ commanded. And the problem is going to be balance. The problem is going to be find, staying in the radical middle where Jesus was. My father's generation fought the social gospel and they emphasized evangelism. My son's generation is fighting evangelism and, uh, and putting forward social justice. If we want to be like Jesus, our ministries have to be combined. We have to be in the radical middle. And this is an illustration of why that is. Second shift is from needs-based to asset-based development. We need people to be subjects rather than objects of healthcare. Um, and this is the perspective we go in with. We see the people we serve as made in the image of God, stewards of resources rather than victims of circumstance. And we don't ask them, what do you need? We focus on their assets first, help them understand the causes, why they have some of the problems they have, Focus on their assets and allow them to create solutions. That's community engagement, and that's what creates not only the opportunity to change a village, but to, to see our work sweep a countryside. And that's the last thing I wanted to talk about is from projects to movements. We want change to sweep the countryside rather than, a, than make a difference in a single village. We need to stop, I hope I'm not stepping on toes. We need to stop wasting so much money going in and putting in wells for people. 
and began to learn to work in an asset-based way that helps them to create solutions that can be multiplied from village to village so that what we get is movements. And so I want to ask you, can you claim that your work has the potential to become a movement that sweeps the countryside? The first question, is it catalyzed by champions? Not by paid people, but by people with a passionate love for, I'm doing it again, people with a passionate love for Jesus Christ who love their neighbors and their motivation is, uh, is their love for him and their love for neighbor and not money. And these champions are nationals, always. If you want a national movement, it is led by nationals. We can be consultants to them behind the scenes, but it's their work. And if we want a movement, it has to be theirs from the beginning. Second, it has to be locally owned. Third, it needs to be asset-based, because if you're bringing in things from the outside, you're creating dependency on those things. If you want to multiply what you're doing, you have to bring that same stuff in every time you go somewhere. But if you're doing an asset-based approach, the, creation, the, the solutions are created locally, and they can be reproduced and multiplied. We talk a lot about sustainability. That's not the question. The question is, is it multipliable? Anything can be sustained. What we want is something that can be multiplied. And integrated, spiritual and physical, uh, across the sectors rather than within them. Uh, agriculturalists need to be able to make disciples. And pastors need to be able to teach health uh, promotion, promotion and disease prevention. Uh, it, it needs to be integrated and multiplying. If your work is those things, then you have the potential of creating a movement that will not only change a village, but sweep the countryside. As you can tell, I'm excited. I think that what we, uh, what we have in community health is an opportunity for the medical world to get out of the back seat and in the front seat in missions. And here's why. You can take the wheel and drive it because the, the only people that are equipped to begin at the village at a level of deep need that, that lays a foundation for the total transformation of the village are community health people. Community health for me has become a framework for global mission in rural villages.